sponsored by McCams, getting you back on two wheels when it wasn't your fault. So in this pocket, you've got your fresh A2 license. In this pocket, you've got about five grand and you want to be a sports biker. There's plenty of choice out there, but today we're talking about this Yamaha YZF R3. So the R3 nestles in between R125, a bike that we've reviewed in the past, and R6, a sports bike that's been around forever and a day. It's supposed to be the perfect step from A1 license, 125, A2 license, this R3, and then your full power license, R6, R1, R1M, and beyond. Relatively unchanged since the launch of this bike back in 2015, there have been some subtle updates that you need to be aware of. I'm gonna to attempt to try and explain how just 42 horsepower can be as exciting as this bike somehow manages to be. So the 42 horsepower motor that this bike has is pretty much identical to the 2015 version. So 321cc, four valve, liquid cool, parallel twin, generates 41.8 horsepower at 10,500 revs and 21.5 foot-pounds of torque at 9,000 revs. There's no point rolling your eyes at the fact that it hasn't gained any more horsepower over the outgoing model that you may have noticed for the last few years, models haven't grown in power or torque. What they have done is, is pass the EU4 legislation at the same time as maintaining that power. That's probably harder in some cases than just gaining a couple of horsepower each time there's a new model. Fans of the smaller capacity R125 and R3 models will notice the gold forks. That's one of the key changes for 2019. 37mm upside down KYB fork with a cartridge kit in it basically. So unadjustable, but a better quality fork than the outgoing bike. At the top of the forks, much like every other bike in the YZF R series, there's like a, a replica R1 style top yoke. It does look and feel a little bit like an R1, as does the shape of the clock set. It isn't the trick TFT one that the top spec model has, but it is quite a funky looking thing. A, funky is good, and B, it also works very well. High light, low light, all the conditions that we rode the bike in. At the other end of the forks, there's a simple brake setup. So single disc, two piston sliding caliper. It's a budget system. That's probably the easiest way to talk about it. We'll talk about how it performs when we get to our riding impression later on but it's quite a simple setup. In between the top and the bottom of the forks is the fairing, another area that Yamaha has worked their magic. They've actually reduced the coefficient drag of the frontal area of the bike by 9%. In doing so, they've been able to up the top speed. Remember, the motor remains the same, so the same power as the old one, but it's faster than the old one because of little things like this coefficient drag thing. So 118 mile an hour top speed now. We didn't get to do 118, but I think we did. Uh, we certainly topped 100 miles an hour, which on the motorway equated to about 7,000 revs. So it's an easy 100 mile an hour bike. So Yamaha is saying that you could get 74 miles to the gallon from this 14 litre tank, which gives you an effective range of about 217 miles or something like that. Now there's no way somebody my size and shape is gonna manage 200 miles plus on a bike this small. But if you are one of those college kids, doing the Monday to Friday thing, knowing that your bike has got 200 miles of range plus, there's gotta be a good thing. It'll save you some money so that you can spend it on weed and pissy lager or whatever it is you buy when you should be in class. So as I said at the start of this review, this isn't a complete redesign of this bike. It's just subtle changes here and there. One of the areas that Yamaha has made a few tweaks is the bars. They're canted out by a couple of degrees, which should make U-turns and round town riding a little bit easier. They've also been dropped 22 mil lower which should increase the turn-in speed and make the front end just feel a little bit livelier. So in terms of upgrades that Yamaha has made to this model, that's pretty much it. So what's it like to ride? Well, fortunately for me, I got to find out in every single environment that you could possibly want to test a bike like this in. Day one was all about town riding. We were in the heart of Valencia, traffic, chaos, murder, you know, cutting everybody up. You had to to get anywhere, doing all that kind of thing. Once we broke out of the city, we were able to add some speed, and get a feel for what this bike is like on faster A roads, dual carriageways and motorways. And then the second day we went and had some fun at the still can't pronounce it, Circuit de la Rabobiera near Valencia racetrack. <music> For my riding impression, I should qualify my size. I'm 90 kilos, so 14 stone one, and I'm five foot 11. If you're none of those things, you might not believe or agree with anything that I'm about to say. But I found this bike very, very easy to ride around town in particular. 
having that tiny bit of extra arm room and leverage on the bars because of the changes that they've made to the geometry of the bike made things easy in terms of cutting in and around unknown traffic. Remember, I ride pretty much every single day in the middle of London, so I'm used to congested, busy, do or die kind of riding, but this is a foreign country and they do do things differently everywhere you go. Once you got into the flow of things around Valencia, this bike was super easy to ride. Power is never gonna be an issue in as much as it's never gonna scare you, you're never gonna overwhelm the tire unless it's snowing or you're riding on ice or something like that. So whenever you get a chance to just go for a little bit of gas, go for all of it, stick it on the stop. Makes a pretty cool noise. The stop bike is fairly muted. Again, that's a downside to EU4. We got to ride the fully pimped race spec version of this bike at the track on day two, and that had the full factory exhaust on it that had uncooked all the power, all of the noise, and it sounded pretty cool. You can buy the halfway house. There is an accessory exhaust in the Yamaha parts catalog. The great thing about riding R3, almost back to back with the R125 at the same time, was that I definitely got the feeling of riding a big bike, a bigger bike. The 125 is, is fairly tiny, especially, like I said, for a guy my size and weight. R3 doesn't really feel like that. It, it, there's something quite substantial about it. You've definitely made a shift up from tiddly little 125 thing to, to something with a little bit more substance. So the controls are dead easy to get hold of, easy to use. There isn't a stack of rider modes to try and get your head around. And the whole thing is very easy to ride. The ride itself is fairly plush, it's not crashing around everywhere. That work that they've done to the forks just seems to smooth everything out, does exactly what you would want it to do. As I said on the 125 launch, you can zing this bike away from the lights and make pretty good progress. Don't get me wrong, don't expect to buy one of these and be set and fire to every bike that you find at the traffic lights. If you want to go quick on it, you can, but you've got to work for it. You've got to know where the bike point is on the clutch. It's a slipper clutch, by the way. You've got to know where peak power is, and you've got to know how to use it perfectly every single time to make those hasty getaways. So the only possibly negative note that I had at the end of the first day was the need to constantly match engine and road speed with the right gear. Now, if you're new to biking, that won't mean anything to you yet, but if you're stepping down to this bike from a larger capacity machine, you'll know what I'm talking about. You leave it in fifth or fourth for too long around town, everything starts to slow down on bigger bikes you can just twist the throttle and find torque on this the torque isn't there so be prepared to go working on that gear lever find the right gear to match the speed that you're doing at that time day two was the track test a full day at a circuit that's primarily designed for go-karting but i've seen videos of scott redding fraping thousand cc bikes around there it's a big track perfect for a bike like this and a perfect chance for us to test the upper limits of those changes to the suspension um, and the various upgrades that they've made to this bike. Now, the one area that you might be disappointed when you start looking into this bike is to see that, you know, where across the entire YZF R range, there's aluminium, delta box, this and that. With R3, it's a steel trellis chassis, steel trellis frame, and also a steel swinging arm. Don't be put off though, I certainly wasn't. Turn one, two, three at the circuit that I still can't pronounce, ended up within about 15 minutes being a big ballsy top of third, sometimes even fourth gear, knee buried in the tarmac, letting the bike do whatever it's doing. It's pinned the whole time. You get to feel like a racer. You get to feel like you're getting your most out of this bike. That's the kind of riding that the R3 encouraged all of us to do. You know, we all arrived quite chilled out and ready for a day on track. Within 15 or 20 minutes, everybody's got their teeth out. We're all going absolutely nuts, trying to go as fast as we can everywhere. And this bike just swallowed everything that we were able to throw at it. So wherever I was putting the bike on track, and it was very easy to place this bike, Dunlop Sport Max tires suit the nature of it perfectly. And once there was some heat in them, you can genuinely place this bike anywhere you like. It's so easy to move and push and pull and just boss around because of the size of the thing. It's only 169 kilos. So heating the tires, bike's doing what you want. It's going exactly where you want it to go. And much like when you're riding on the road, you know, short of being right on the very, very edges of the tread on the side of the sidewall of the tire, you know, I'm talking like this, you can pretty much everywhere else go full gas every time you want some throttle. The downside to that is adding speed and eventually needing to rely on those brakes. Now, I don't think the brakes are up to the job that the rest of the bike is up to. And having jumped in between sessions from 125 to R3, I think the R125 brakes felt better and performed better than this single disc sliding two piston caliper setup on the R3. On the road, it's no real issue. You'll get your head around it and you'll get used to using them and it's fine. I'm not gonna spend ages banging on about the track ride. It was as good in the first session as it was in the last session. The bike was faultless all day. And if anything, all we were doing was getting a little bit cockier and pushing our luck a tiny little bit. I think one of the foreign journos went down 
you know, we were taking our turns to jump on the R3 race bike. I had a session on that as well. First time I felt my age in ages. I'm not even 40 years old, but I felt old when I rode that bike. Pulled a muscle in my neck where I was cramped up like a tiny pretzel on that thing. Great fun, stacks of ground clearance, made a cool noise. It was a cool race bike. It definitely is a race bike, but I was just too big and too fat and too old to enjoy it. So my summary of this bike is gonna be quite long-winded and a little bit strange. You'll need to stick with me. I need to tell you the price. First of all, it's 5,299 quid. Of course, that sounds like a lot of money because of course it is a lot of money. So you may be wondering why you've just spent the last six or seven minutes listening to me rambling on about a bike that bears absolutely no resemblance to your biking needs. Now, it's important to consider that we know our core audience of fans and, and viewers and bikers in general are all super experienced, tire shredding, you know, MotoGP gods that came out of the womb with worn knee sliders on. Now, clearly that isn't the case. We know that, and I think some of you do as well. But every now and then we cop a little bit of flack for talking about, you know, license friendly A1 and A2 machines, even Harleys and other stuff that sit on the fringes of what we all accept as mainstream motorcycling. We have to talk about bikes like these so that those kids can be informed and buy the right bikes and become the badasses that we all are when they're 10 or 15 years into riding. So the next time you see a guy with L plates on, wobbling his way to college, chuck him a little nod and just accept that everybody starts somewhere, you were that guy one day. Chances are, you know, he's gonna end up on one of these in the next year or two and he's gonna have nothing but fun riding a bike like this whenever he can. Sponsored by McCams, getting you back on two wheels when it wasn't your fault.